Coming up, actor and community activist Lauren Anthony joins us in the studio to share his latest projects, Land Back for a Small Alaska Native Community. Plus, we get a sneak preview of a new Native comic expo in Denver. I'm Malia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in southern Arizona, where officials are dealing with the aftermath of a fatal shooting involving a Native American man. Earlier this month, U.S. Border Patrol agents shot Raymond Matia on Tahana Odham tribal lands near the U.S.-Mexico boundary. According to newly released details, Border Patrol agents were answering reports of gunfire when they encountered Matia. They say they saw him throw something and raise his arm, which which caused the agents to open fire, striking Matia several times. Tohono O'odham Nation Chairman Ned Norris Jr. later identified the 58-year-old man as a tribal citizen. Officials say because of bad weather, immediate medical assistance was unavailable and Matia died at the scene. There were at least seven other agents at the scene who activated their body cameras during the shooting. CPB says it will release the footage when doing so does not impact its investigation. The agents involved in the shooting are on leave with pay. Surfing is coming to the mainland at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. ICT's Pacey Smith-Garcia takes a look at a new exhibit exciting visitors. Surfing is at the Heard Museum with the new Hehe Nolu exhibit, which tells the spiritual and the indigenous history of the sport. It features surfboards and artifacts that tell the stories of famous Native Hawaiian surfers. Velma Craig, the assistant curator at the Heard Museum, explained what guests can look forward to seeing. We have a legends wall, or a wall of legends, where Ian Kuali'i did um, cut out portraits of many influential people who were Native Hawaiian who contributed to the story of surfing. Um, we have surfboards from the Bishop Museum that were loaned to us that belong to um, prominent figures. Along with the historical figures from surfing, one can also learn about how Native Hawaiians have used this art form since time immemorial. It was very important for us to center the exhibition, especially in the beginning when you first enter the gallery. The spirituality and the cultural significance of surfing to Kanaka Maoli. Um, so surfing was originated with Native Hawaiians and it was tied to the royalty. And for those who aren't near the ocean, the exhibit also brings in another popular sport. We always intended to, to have skateboarding as one of the sections in this exhibition because we wanted to make sure that we tied it back to, um, you know, just indigenous communities in general who aren't from um, areas where there's a lot of water. We live here in Phoenix, which is the desert, and um, I know that, you know, within our um, native communities in the southwest, skateboarding is, is very popular with our native youth. In Phoenix, Arizona, Paisy Smith-Garcia, ICT News. In Seattle, Washington, a man has been convicted and sentenced for representing himself as a Native American artist. Jerry Chris Van Dyke pleaded guilty to violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act at his court hearing in March. Going by the name Jerry Witten, he worked with a gallery in the area of Pike Place Market for more than 10 years. He sold over $1,000 worth of carved pendants as Native American artwork, despite having no tribal affiliation himself. Because he represented himself as Nez Perce, the gallery owner provided him with supplies like ivory and antlers to make the pendants. Van Dyke admitted to in court to undercover agents buying his artwork in 2019 and that he knew about the Indian Arts and Crafts Act but was not a tribal citizen. He was sentenced to 18 months of federal probation earlier this month. 
There's a new grant program aiming to help tribes preserve their languages. The Living Languages Grant will be providing funding for tribes to create immersion programs and continue the work on those who already have them. This type of education offers fluent teachers the opportunity to consistently speak with their students in their indigenous languages. The program comes from the Office of Indian Economic Development. It is expected to award between 18 to 22 of these three-year grants, totaling upwards of 300 $100,000. Applications are currently being accepted through August 18th at grants.gov. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Dene citizen Lauren Anthony is an actor, artist, and community activist who recently starred in the movie How to Blow Up a Pipeline. It follows environmental activists who plan to disrupt a pipeline amid an ongoing climate crisis. Lauren is also the founder of the organization Chij for Che, which delivers over 80 loads of free firewood every year to high-risk elders on the Navajo Nation. I'm joined now with Lauren in our studio. Hi, Lauren. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So I want to start off with your latest film that premiered last April. Tell us about it. How to Blow Up a Pipeline is in theaters everywhere currently right now, and it's getting ready for uh, streaming services later this year. But it's a film that uh, started off as a, an idea that turned into an indie project that turned into a bunch of friends just getting together. And uh, overnight, it got sold during the Toronto International Film Festival. And from there, it just blew up and went worldwide. And tell us what role you played in the film. I play Edward. Um, it, just like any other um, family member that supports another family member that's in the drive for the front lines of um, activism to any other potential ideas or goal-driven initiatives, <clears throat> um, we, have a we, have, we all have a family member who really strives to push us in, in certain ways. So I play that character for one of the other characters in the film played by Forrest Goodluck and um, just being a supportive brother to him in, on film and in real life. We know that in real life, pipelines and especially mm -hmm. fighting against pipelines is something that a lot of indigenous people have been doing. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk about how that translated into this film. A lot of the, the film stuff that we're doing now with um, storytelling is very impactful that um, we can create content that is going to change the world through film. And a lot of times we don't realize that um, our voices, our stories, the way we perceive ourselves as an image and representation, it can make an impact into motivating people. Just like watching old classic films of boxing or some athlete overcoming an achievement, it makes you get up and want to go work out or do something better for yourself. So this film in particular also raises awareness without um, really making it the, uh, the highlight of, of everything, but more like, Let's see what we can do to inquire minds to get more educated about the situations that people are going through because there's a lot of environmental justice going on. There's a lot of impact going on with our climate change and the impact of just the legalities of like what the land rights are for people all around the world. This is your latest project, but of course you've been on many different productions. For you personally, what stands out the most in terms of your TV or film work? Oh my gosh. I, I've been in 38 films so far and you know at one point in my career I was told I'll never work in Hollywood again and that was just because of who I am as a community member and a, a active person in my in my tribe uh, and for just indigenous people in general because I work with youth, I work with addicts, I work with a lot of people so I think the biggest role that I've played in film is just being a good person, being somebody that's going to be proactive and you know, taking care of what's needed to be done. Because a lot of people can say things, but actually doing it and walking and doing, putting words into your actions is a big thing. So that role of um, being a community person, role model for our kids and, and anybody in, in coming up in recovery, I think that's one of the big things for me that I feel that's more important than the, what role stands out. Because that's, to me, that's more important. That's a great segue into the opening, which is about you getting firewood for mm -hmm. some elders. How did that idea start for you? It was actually a drunk idea. <laughs> <laughs> my buddy Wes and I, we were drinking out my old apartment after I was in between touring because I used to play heavy metal a lot and that was my thing. So half my life was touring, playing heavy metal music with a lot of big bands, you know, being on the radio, record labels. 
it was a chaotic life, but I came from a good family. I knew I had more potential, but that time we came up with the idea of Chij for Che, just that night, and uh, we never acted on it. So Chij for Che means firewood in Navajo, and, um, and it means um, the firewood for grandpa in particular. And so we're not discriminating against the grandmas because we do help out a lot of grandmas. And the idea just kind of expanded because I wanted to do something that was that I never seen in my lifetime. I've heard stories about it from certain people, but to get out there and actually do it was something. And that was always scary because I knew I, it was going to take a lot of work. And being an addict, I also looked at like, how am I going to make a difference if, if I'm going to make this about me or if I'm going to you know, try to find a way to get paid. And I had to get over those things as an addict. But once I eventually stayed on it, um, I got healthy. I was away. I was up in the mountains. I got back in shape because I was almost 300 pounds at that time. And it, it took a lot of effort to get on track with it. And now we're in the thousands of loads. I know you said 80 loads for 80 families. That's beyond that now. Last year we did 2,500 loads for the Navajo people and the Hopi people. So we're not just helping elders anymore. We're helping out single fa um, parent families. We're helping out you know relatives that have ceremonies and a lot of uh, in-between stuff too. So we're doing home repairs, um, providing mutual aid still. We're doing mutual aid before it was cool and uh, we're still doing it. On so many tribal reservations, having firewood is quite literally the way to stay warm mm -hmm. or to eat your food or boil your water. When you're delivering the, this, these loads of firewood to people, what is their reaction? It's always the same. Uh, a lot of overwhelming of emotion because to us, as native people, firewood is very much needed on all of our lands. And you know, sp speaking sp uh, specifically to the Navajo Nation, 70% of our people don't have running water, utilities, gas, and stuff like that that we would have in the common border towns. And the need for firewood, like you said, was for cooking, cleaning, and also ceremony and for prayer. So when the Navajo Nation got hit hard, it was because you know a lot of water needed to be boiled to be used to clean, and that that was a big factor. And you got multi general families living together, and a lot of them are fixed on on fixed income, no income, and to provide firewood, a lot of families have to have a choice of like four hundred dollars a load for a, a load of wood, or do I spend it on groceries and my bills? So there's at least we can eliminate that part with the firewood and that to them is a big sign of relief which I really found really grateful and the other thing is like we're continuing this uh, legacy of the word eh, which means your relatives so we're, c we're continuing putting the words into actions by providing simple acts of kindness by bringing firewood mm. I'm really curious what ne what's next for you what's next for me um, I'm producing now I'm getting into casting I, I've do done a lot of um, talent management for a lot of our people. So I'm being an advocate and still in the sense of the film industry as well, because we need a lot of strong voices within the film industry, especially for our indigenous people. Uh, it's uh, time for more names to be thrown in the hats. And that's what I would like to see and create our own content as much as we can. So I'm producing a film called The Last Stop, and I'm gonna hopefully feed starting that this summer and it's gonna be fun and it's like a whole uh, breath of fresh air to just go out there and do your own thing and they talk about you know wanting to be invited to the table and now it's to the point where i'm going to build my own table lauren anthony thank you so much thank you A big win looms for a small Alaska Native community after it raised nearly $2 million to buy back more than 400 acres of its homelands. ICT's Stuart Huntington has this report. The Copper River flows for 290 miles out of Alaska's Wrangell Mountains, and its vast basin has been home to the Atna people for 5,000 years. Most of the land, of course, was lost to Russian and then American appropriation, but today the tiny native village of Taslina, a federally recognized tribe comprised of 116 Atna native Alaskans, is poised to reclaim a small but meaningful piece, says Tribal Council Vice President Lakaya Engbertson. It really was an investment for our future generations to have the property. So I'm very excited to be able to um, have that be part of the tribe's history. 
The land was once the site of a mission boarding school for native youth run by the Catholic Church. In 1953, the federal government sold 462 acres in Taslina to the Archdiocese of Anchorage, Juno for about $500. The school closed in 1971 and burned to the ground in 1976. The site was contaminated with asbestos and a danger to the community. After the church cleaned up the site to EPA standards in 2014, the village began the long work to regain stewardship of the land. In 2018, it entered into a contract with the archdiocese to buy the land for almost $2 million. Leaders were nervous, not just at the prospect of raising such a large sum, but even putting up a small amount of earnest money, says tribal president Gloria Stickwan. When they said, put a thousand dollars down, I thought we were going to lose our thousand dollars We, uh, if we didn't uh, pull out of the agreement before the time was up and that uh, we barely had one million dollars in program monies to begin with and to raise $1.8 million, to me, it seemed impossible. The conversation was, if we put $1,000 in and we don't raise the money and we don't meet our goals, we're out $1,000. But from the first coffee can collection that netted $21.50 in 2017 to a GoFundMe page to some major donations from foundations, the village raised the money and expects to close on the land this spring, even though the task seemed daunting at times. I, I doubted it all the way through almost until I finally got confirmation from people that uh, they were gonna, they're working on the closing agreements, and then I, um, I started believing. But all the way through, I doubted whether it would, it would happen. Both village and church leaders say they share a good relationship, and both sides are happy with the prospect of the transaction. But some have questioned if the land is really the church's to sell. The deed on the land states that it is for a mission school, and the government has kept the mineral rights. The deed also grants permanent access to those with pre-existing fishing rights. But one native family had to sue the church to secure rights to its 1.3-acre fishing camp along the river. The church tried to sell the land once before in 1976. That deal fell through because the buyers couldn't mine the land or get financing because of the mission school deed language, according to Native American Rights Fund lawyer Matt Newman. The title to that property is clouded and it could not be available for purchase in any way besides from the people who have a historical use of the land. The situation is not unique. This month, a group of archivists, historians, and concerned Catholics published a list of 87 Catholic-run native boarding schools that operated before 1978 across 22 states. It was common practice for the government to provide land to underwrite Indian boarding schools. It's an open question how much of that government land is still in Catholic Church possession, says Chris Stainbrook from the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. And the Catholic Church owns a huge amount of land on some of the bigger reservations where they've had either schools and or churches. Um, and they're beginning to think about how they can make a contribution back to the the reservation and the tribes, but it's a slow process at best. Taslina just kind of, you know, is the tip of the spear, if you will, compared to what the Catholic Church actually owns on reservations collectively. But for today, the focus in Taslina is on hope, says tribal administrator Marcy Simeon. I would encourage any tribe or any other small entity to not be deterred by the obstacles in front of you and put your faith in God, have the support of your community and knows what can happen. It's happening for us and it's a powerful thing. In Carbondale, Colorado, Stuart Huntington, ICT News. In Denver, Colorado, Lakota and Cherokee citizen Christina Maldonado Badhand and her husband are preparing an Indigenous comic expo. ICT's Stuart Huntington caught up with the pair. Christina, Raphael, welcome to the show. 
<laughs> thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th- thanks for joining us. Th- this is exciting. You guys have a big event uh, coming up in Denver. Yeah, it's uh, called IACON. Um, so it's an Indigenous comic and arts festival. So IACON is really a celebration of indigeneity hosted by North American Indigenous people. And so um, how we started it was we actually uh, had brought the Indigenous Con here in 2019, and that was started by Lee Francis. And then um, that was called IPX. And while we had that show in 2019, we kind of realized that we wanted to branch off and create another event that would be a little bit more multicultural um, and kind of explore the idea of our connection to land. The IACON is meant to really be a point of connection and network for all different types of people. So we have over 100 artists um, and vendors that all range from doing beadwork and ribbon skirts to augmented reality and robots. We have anime, we have comic books, um, multiple different performances that are all different types of music, even like gospel and punk rock in the same lineup. So uh, it's a very eclectic show. I'm really excited to see this very diverse. You definitely can't say Iacon is not diverse. That sounds wonderful. Uh, Raphael, you're working on a new uh, a comic with new native characters? Yeah, actually, um, before that, I'm I'm finishing up my final issue for the first season of my, my first book, which was Pia. And that's uh, about a nine-year-old little girl in post-apocalyptic Denver, where all our creatures have mutated and we're down at the bottom of the food chain. And so she's just trying to get back to her dad. So it's a self-discovery coming of age type story. Um, but I'm almost done with that one before I launch to the next season. But I do have a book that I'm working on with a buddy of mine, uh, Richard Crow song. And um, the team is called Talon. Um, and we have a bunch of different characters that all different walks of life, um, native and mixed cultures. Um, Kind of going back to the whole 90s aesthetic, a lot of action, a lot of like superhero stuff. Um, but we started that story and then we met with a buddy of ours named uh, Teddy So, and um, he's from Nevada. And uh, we started a whole new publishing uh, company. It's kind of like an umbrella company to kind of help natives like get their independent work out. Um, and so he's uh, the creator of Captain Paiute. And then we brought a bunch of other artists along and we came up with a nice big uh, crossover story that we're working on. It's a graphic novel. We're looking at about, I think, just over 70, uh, almost 80 pages. Um, And what we did was we just collaborated and brought all our characters together to fight one big, nasty like group of people. And it's serving as a introduction, even though some of these characters have been out for a couple of years, so that people can kind of see what they do, who they are. And then um, they get to learn where to find them later and pick up their books, uh, order them online or whatnot. Tell me about what it means to you bringing um, indigenous worldview, indigenous culture into the uh, comic art form. It means a lot. The both of us have been kind of comic artists for a while, him a little bit longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> um I kind of started in 2015, there was a big rise of Indigenous comic artists and um, a comic company called Indigenous Narrative Collective that then became Native Realities. And uh, all of those artists have kind of gone on to work for Marvel as part of Marvel's Indigenous Voices. And uh, I've kind of been more on the event planning and kind of like teaching education side of art than really the independent comic side. Um, That's mostly his stuff. I do like to still color my own comics and things, Um, but it it means a lot. You know, the part of the reason we started IACON and the name actually Aya is um, Lakota for change. So it means to change or to become. And the reason that we really started it was to create connections and networks and really uplift other artists. The whole point of our uh, festival is really to build those connections and giving people opportunity. I started a um, program called the Novice Artist Program, which gives an opportunity for aspiring artists to have a table for free at the festival. And they get some experience on if they wanna keep doing that and see what those paths might lead to. So um, that's really like the whole envision behind IACON. (laughs) Christina, in Denver, you're working on something that you're calling Living Land Acknowledgement. What's that? Yeah, so um, that's a project that I had started uh, 
actually a while ago, but finally got funding for it last year um, and did the first pilot one at the Seeds of Power Unity Garden. And the project is really meant to be a living land acknowledgement, just like the uh, name says. So oftentimes our community complains about land acknowledgements being just kind of a statement that people say, and then that's it. There's no follow-up, there's no healing, there's no like continued work with the indigenous community. It's just like, a, it's almost like a, a statement to acknowledge, but not actually do any kind of growth from that. So the land acknowledgement project came up with, uh, it's a living topiary sculpture that goes inside of a community garden. And the purpose for that is that the sculpture will be essentially the native indigenous land acknowledgement part. So the sculpture represents our imagery and it'll have a story. Oh, all of them are customizable. The idea is for them to be all over Denver um, because I use plants that help with the pollination around here that kind of bring back indigenous plants. Christina, Raphael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you yeah, for having sure. us. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.